Hey Ned, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, I'm I'm glad I managed to get hold of you um, to discuss Dakar this year because uh, it's been very different from previous years, and uh, I thought, you know what, we need a podcast on this, and I thought, who better to do it with than Ned? So there. <laughs> There we have so, it. So I'm I'm really pleased that you accepted uh, the request to do it and have a discussion about Dakar. Um, but first, let's just discuss who you are, because there might be people following that have no idea who this Ned guy is. So, <laughs> um, I go I like to introduce myself as the guy who took Linden Desert Racing the first time. Yes, that's a really really <laughs> good point. That's a really really good point. And actually, you cost me a load of money, but I wouldn't yeah. change it for the world. Yeah, I have um, done. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you tell everybody about yourself? You do that. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Ned Cease. Uh, I went by the handle Ned Duro on Adventure Rider. I got to know Lyndon many years ago. What's that? Probably like 2005, thereabouts. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think we first met, we were aware of each other on the forum, but I think we first met, you came up to my birthday party in Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a bunch of riding together there, and then uh, we decided it would be a good idea to race a super enduro. Originally, it was going to be in Vegas to Reno, but then I had some family situation that prevented that from happening, and so mm -hmm. we did the Baja 1000 together in 2007. Um, and I think you and I and another friend of ours, Tim Hillsammer, mm -hmm. uh, rode a 950 super enduro in the longest thousand there's been it actually finished in los cabos that year yeah um had a great time and then since then have done a lot of travel together and so on although the last few years what it's probably been five years since we got to be in the same place at the same time yeah it seems like it's way too long since we rode together for sure um yeah i can't even remember the last time we rode together but it was probably riding some crazy single track somewhere in the u.s i think <laughs> Yeah, I think that's right. I think you came and visited me in Colorado. Yeah, that's and right. And then on your on your on round the world, world trip. trip. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, and the, I think the other the other memory that I have, and it'll be interesting if you have the same memory I do. So I raced the Dakar in 2012, and I remember coming back from it and calling you and saying, like, mate, you got to go do it. And um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I, I remember. think you were. <laughs> you already wanted to, I mean, it's not like it was an idea that I put in your head, but I think I was, you know, someone who pushed you toward, like, you you got to make this happen. It's such an adventure. Yeah. From my side and for the listeners as well, like, there's, there's absolutely no secret that it, it was you, Ned, that made me do it <laughs> in the nicest way. Like, it was it was your phone call that said you can do it and you can make it happen and you know you shared a lot of your experience about raising money and funds and everything and that's how I got into my first Dakar I mean you you knew that I had the riding ability to do it and the right mindset and you were the one that pushed me over the edge of the fears about how can I afford to do it you know and you gotta go and do it and you'll make a plan and you'll make it work and and I did and and yeah so thanks for that yeah uh you're you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I mean, to me, that that cuts right to the the first thing that I I feel like we should talk about with this year's mm -hmm. Dakar is, yeah. You know, when we when we went to do the Dakar, the rule was that if you failed to finish a stage, um, if you failed to finish a liaison, etc., uh, you were out. Yeah. And both of us were in a situation where it was everything we had financially and maybe slightly more in order to be at the start line. And, you know, I, I hear people say like, Oh, I'm so glad that they have these, these, uh, what do they call them? Jokers that you're allowed yeah, yeah. three restarts. Uh, yeah. elite riders are allowed one restart and yeah. non elite riders are allowed three restarts. Yeah. And people think that's a, a good thing because imagine if you'd laid your life on the line, but yeah. to me, curious for your thoughts about that yeah um look it's uh it's definitely changed how the rally comes across it's a bit more it just 
it doesn't feel the same, you know? Like, if I think to all the people that tried, you know, I think of Patsy Quick. I mean, amazing story. She, I can't remember how many times she tried, but she tried and tried and tried to finish this thing and then finished it. And boy, she earned it, you know? She managed to finish the Dakar Rally. And that was what it was all about. It was like getting to the finish, completing every single leg of the rally. And it seems like now with these new rules, that's well, it doesn't seem like it is the case that you don't have to. Yes, for for points and for for position in the rally, I, believe, I mean, I haven't read up on the rules 100%, but I think to get a position in the rally, a genuine, you know, you don't get come back in where you were, you get a big penalty. Right. Yeah, so it crushes you right yep. down the order. Um, but also... I guess you still have the right to ride up on the podium and say you finished the Dakar rally, but you didn't, if you know what I mean. It's kind of, it's different. Yeah, it is different. And and I think uh, it takes away some of the meaning to me. Mm. Uh, I, I can understand how people feel like, um, you know, it's, it's more reasonable. But to me, the whole event is unreasonable, and that's kind of the point of why you go. Mm. And and so uh, all I cared about was finishing. That was my goal. Same. And and I feel like if I'd finished with an asterisk, no matter how no matter how small, you know, I I was a hundred yards short of the finish, uh, but they gave me a restart, and then I was able to complete it. Yeah. I I don't I don't I feel like that's hollow. Yeah. Well, the I... other. Yeah, go on. yeah, the the other thought that I had about that is when I was there, the the feeling of the event changed so much with people dropping out and dropping out and dropping out, and mm-hmm. you know you're you're at gas or you're at the start or finish, and and the people that were there yesterday who have been your your friends in this like mm. such a meaningful point in your life yeah. are suddenly gone, yeah, and they're and they're physically not present, yeah, and so it that really drives home how serious an undertaking it is. Yeah. And I think it's a loss for, for it to be like, oh, well, they were gone yesterday, but they're here today. Mm. It's like, well, that isn't, that isn't how this is supposed to work, I don't believe. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share my personal experience of a similar thing. Uh, when I did Mizuga Valley in 2013, just after the Dakar it was, um, I did Mizuga Valley and I got serious food poisoning and I, I tried to race the stage. Um, I almost got helicoptered out. Like, it was terrible. Like, I, I could mm-hmm. not do it. And so I came back to the bivouac. Uh, I was on a drip. They told me I had to take a day off, you know. Um, and, and I did that. And then they said, it's okay. You can go back and ride. And get you, you paid to come here so you can carry on riding, you know. Mm-hmm. I'll be honest, in my mind, I didn't finish that rally. I didn't finish yeah. that rally because I missed a day. I didn't finish that rally because I got food poisoning. I don't care whether it was injury, food poisoning, mechanical failure. I didn't finish the rally. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it, I, I know what it feels like to ride to the end of a rally, but not really finish it. And to be honest, it's not the same. From my experience of yeah. finishing the Dakar, the accomplishment was I made it to the end of every single stage. Um, and that's no mean feat. And like when you, when you think about what it is, it's an endurance race. That's what it always mm-hmm. was. It was a, it was an adventure for Thierry Sabine and his, fr- and his friends in the desert to get from point A to point B that were 10,000 kilometers apart, you know? And it's always been that you have to do the full journey. And this year right. it's changed. Yeah, yeah. I think it has been changing, but I think the this year is the culmination and sort of hit a tipping point of change where it suddenly feels very different to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, another, another thought that I had about that, um, uh, in November, I'm down in Baja right now. I'm, mm-hmm. We're talking and I'm, I'm down there. And in November, the thousand came down to near where I am and I went up and watched it go by. And it seems like just a shadow of what it used to be. And, and it mm-hmm. is the entries are down and, and so on. Yeah. And when I look at it, I feel like um, the privateers in Baja or in Dakar bring so much passion. Mm. You know, they, they, uh, they're working on their vehicle around their normal job. Yeah. They're 
straining their finances, they're straining their relationship mm -hmm. with their spouse, they're doing all these things to try yeah. to be able to uh, to attend, and uh, and that and that passion just permeates mm -hmm. what they're doing, and so on one hand, you know, who cares if there's if the the last half of the trophy trucks that didn't finish weren't there. Yeah. But on the other hand, and and the same with bikes, of course. I mean, that's really where my passion is, is the motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And the entries are much smaller and and still the people who win are going really fast, no question. Mm -hmm. But I feel like in both Dakar and in Baja, the loss of those mm -hmm. uh, amateur competitors is really a loss to the soul of the rally. Mm, it's it's not a loss to the to the 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 person who wins it is still an amazing athlete and did an amazing thing and and that's yeah. true then and it's true now, mm. but I feel like it it really hollows out the meaning of the race that that makes yeah. it a human adventure instead of just a mm. just a technological spectacle. I so. agree. I agree and I think um for sure a big uh, a big change has been the ASO and the organization with the world championship now um, you know they, they're trying to make uh, they're trying to make something something worthy you know a, a world championship for offer desert racing which is which is fantastic yeah but it yep. se seems yep. to be like the Dakar rally and those world championship rounds is edging further away from those adventure riders and those grassroots races and what we what we're probably seeing is yeah the numbers have probably gone down a little bit which they have um and we'll see other events come on the cards you know we've got the africa race yeah they have the restart rule but they don't they don't try to be the dakar rally you know they're just a fam it's like a family it's a big rolling family and everyone aims to get to the finish line um it has a feeling that's more like the original dakar to me um yeah so i think the dakar rally is probably you know it's it, in in the desert racing world it's kind of like the formula one and motor gp now <laughs> Yeah. Um, and and uh, w there's always going to be plenty of other races for those amateurs and you know it's interesting like this year I'm going to take the team to Hellas Valley and mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to it because I think um, there's going to be a lot of people that will be rallying for the first time and you know to, to share experience and and be around those people is really what it makes me happy to be around those people you know mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be it's going to be interesting to do that. Well, and I think to that point, they, they are that passion, they are that soul, mm. and the, the people who are, you know, doing it for the first time and who are, um, or, or for the fifth time, but, but not for the nth time, you yeah. know, and, yeah. uh, and to me, um, Dakar ceases to be what it once was when it no longer cares about that, that yeah. newer rider, that, mm. that, yeah. Uh, and and let's face it, you, you can't just turn up and do the Dakar anymore. You know, they're, no. they're forcing you not only to do one, but like this year, you had people that paid to go to Rally Andalusia to qualify were then told that they didn't qualify and they had to go to Morocco as well. I mean, it's, it, it, I understand the safety side of it, but it's not, it, it's, I, I get it. I know why they have to qualify because they have to prove to the organization that they're not going to be stuck in the desert and cause a huge issue, you know? Um, but that again, that takes it away from where it once was. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very different, but you know, yeah. it's what it is. It's still a, an amazing event and I've really enjoyed following it this year. I don't know about you. Um, yeah. it's, it, yeah. you know, we, we can get onto the race a little bit without dwelling too much on how it's changed, but, um, this year it's been amazing to watch. I mean, the, the, I have to say the Eurosport footage has, up, has upped its game and you've probably seen clips of that and bits of it. Um, it's on for an hour long. It's a proper program like you would get with like a world championship event. Um, uh, it's good. It covers all the field. It covers the back markers. It covers some stories throughout the bivouac. It covers local stories. I mean, it's, it's good. And I've seen a lot of other things as well. Um, a lot of other media channels coming out of the Dakar and, and certainly we're seeing more people um, doing like vlogs and stuff. I've no idea why that is, but <laughs> a lot more people. Doing... Me neither. It's a, yeah. it's a brand new idea this year. 
<laughs> yeah, no one's ever done it before, right? Um, no. But no, it's it's been great. And uh, what you know, talking about it becoming the Formula One and MotoGP of uh, desert racing, uh, the the top end of the field is just it's amazing. I mean, the 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 speed that those guys are willing to to travel, um, it's almost we know that there's no wonder that there's accidents i mean it's you know we can all like push ourselves to the very edge but there's going to be accidents eventually i mean i you know i crash when i push that hard and it's uh, it's happened on this rally uh, again yeah i i think one of the big stories there for me has been mason klein yeah for, um, sure. for sure i mean so yeah so so shortly before uh, he w- had just gotten back from Morocco. It was, I guess, right at the very end of October. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to stop and spend a night with he and his family mm-hmm. um, and do an interview for Upshift with him. Yeah. And, and I have to be honest, I, I missed, I didn't, I didn't anticipate. I knew that he was fast. I know that he's a legitimate rider. Mm-hmm. I know that he's done a lot of work on navigation and really put a lot of energy into doing that Mm. well. But he's, he said, you know, I want to, I want to finish in the top 10. And I was like, well, you know, like maybe, maybe you need to, uh, think about that. And well, if you'd told me he was going to be leading, uh, Mm. you know, Mm. on stage eight, he was going to be ahead of, I think both Toby and Ricky, I would yeah. have said there's no way, and okay. sure so enough. That, that brings me on to a really interesting topic, Well, and we're going to carry on talking about Mason as well afterwards, but yeah, great. Let, let's face it, the 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 roadbook rule, the change in the roadbook yeah. rule, handing the roadbook out 20 minutes or whatever it is now before the start of the stage, let's face it, that has allowed those fast privateer riders to get into the mix, and that is brilliant. Like that, It's I think, all for the better. That that rule, all better. that rule is yeah. one rule that I actually one hundred percent agree with. It's got rid of the map men and it's leveled the playing field. And what it's allowed to do, it's what I always say. Like you know, you know, you, there's kids in the world that are super fast at go karting, but they never have the opportunity to prove themselves because they can't mix it with the big guns because they can't afford to go or something like that. Yeah. In the cross country rally world, the road book change has allowed that to happen. It's allowed people to get into the mix with the top guys at top events and prove that they can do it. And Mason is a class act. He's a, absolutely shown the world that if you're a fast rider and you put the time into learning and practicing and training and putting all your energy into it, however old you are, and uh, you know he's, he's got age on his side at 20 years old, but you can go and do it. If you put your mind to it, you yeah. can go and do it. And he's done that. He's clearly done that. And, uh, yeah. you know, all credit to him because if, if I, you know, I saw him do Sonora Rally and I can't remember if I finished Sonora Rally. Was it, where did he finish in Sonora Rally? Can remember. Third or fourth. Third maybe? or fourth, I thought. Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that. And I thought, mm, yeah, he's like off the back of off the back of the fast guys, you know. And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, when he gets to Dakar, it'll be a different game, you know. I thought that and, too. And he's, proved, that too. He's, he's proved me wrong. And uh, if if you're ever watching and this, Ma- a... Mason, well done, because you d- I definitely didn't expect to see you up there. Or if I did, I expected to see you there for one or two days and then have a huge crash. And you've been consistent, which is fantastic. I mean, it's amazing. Good for him. Did you... Um, so there's uh, our friend Jesse and Quinn Cody are doing a, a podcast called the Dakar Rally Daily. Hmm. And they... They had a call in with Skyler before he went out. Matthias Wagner was there and Mason was there. Mm. And on the phone call, Matthias said to Mason, like, I'm really impressed. I can't believe how fast you're going. And you opened today for 100 kilometers and I couldn't pass you. <laughs> that yeah, is stunning. Yeah, stunning. That yeah. is stunning. And, yeah. and so to hear that mm. uh, is just like, this isn't a flash in the pan. This isn't like a, hmm. uh, oh, I, he got lucky for a stage or anything like that. It's yeah. fully legitimate that well, he's where he is. If Mason doesn't have four offers on the table after Dakar, 
I, I mean, I don't yeah. know what anyone else can do because he has done exactly what he needed to do. He didn't need to win the rally. Uh, he needed to show that he was fast and he needed to get to the finish and be consistent and he's done it. So, you know, whatever happens now, he's done it and that's awesome for him. I, I really hope he gets the fact I still want to see a finish. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure, for sure I want to see a finish. Yeah. Um, but I hope he gets the ride that he deserves and I hope he can turn himself into a factory rider and, uh, and go and kick some butt because he deserves it. So. Yeah, and and no I wish doubt. I really like. I mean, you know, I didn't get into rally racing until I was thirty years old, thirty two years old or yeah. something. Uh, man, I wish I'd have started when I was twenty. He's got the whole, you know, he's, the next ten years are the, the the best years of his life for rally racing. So he, he's yeah. he's got every opportunity to get on with it now. So good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Totally awesome. The the other thing I I would just say on on his behalf is. You know, I think it's possible for there to be, for someone to be a little bit, um, uh, what's the word? Oh, just to see someone that young doing something expensive and feel like, oh, is he just entitled? Yeah. And, and I, I understand that question, hmm. but I didn't get that sense at all. I see him as a student of rally and someone who's invested in learning hmm. as much as he can about it and doing the best at it that he can. Hmm. Hmm. And... Uh, and I think that's really cool. And I think, um, like you say, you know, most people come to rally on the heels of another career. And it's just really interesting to see someone who's starting with rally instead of, you know, over here, it's, it's, you know, hair scrambles and score yeah. racing and so on. Uh, in Europe, it might be more enduro. Mm. Um, it's neat to see someone or apparently MotoGP, that would be the yeah. other gateway. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean let's uh, just talk about that for a minute, eh? I mean yeah. Danilo Petucci, I mean I I can't say wow enough. Like to change from a discipline such as Moto GP into the rally world, yes, he had an incident on one day and, and didn't finish, but honestly, wipe that aside, he went out straight back on it and won a stage and continuously kept getting top positions on stages. I mean, I don't know, I don't he's an alien. For sure, he's one of yeah. them. He's, he's one of yeah. those aliens, and uh, and and he so deserves it. And to see, uh, to see how much that meant to him in his eyes, you know, we saw him crying on videos and stuff. I mean, you, you can't imagine just to go through that and put yourself in that position and and be able to do that is just is mind blowing. I mean, I would cry on television. Oh, I do cry a lot. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. uh, it's really great and. Uh, yeah, I can't say enough about that. I mean, you know, let's face it. I, I dare say, well, I can say this, I think. None of the top factory riders in rally are going to jump on a MotoGP bike and win a MotoGP, so. No. <laughs> what a boy. No. What yeah. a boy, yeah. I, I was thinking about that, and I, I was thinking, I wonder if he feels like rally bikes are slow. Like, <laughs> you know, you hold it to the stop, and it's just like, is that all? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure there's parts where he's thinking, yeah, I could do with the next 40 horsepower or so or even more. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, he's, uh, he really has. It, it's been a pleasure to see him in the Dakar. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. I'm, and and uh, kudos for KTM for giving him that opportunity to do it because, uh, you know, obviously that, that was probably a... Uh, it was probably a discussion in the pub one night <laughs> that that turned into a let's do it and uh, yeah I feel that I feel that's a good thing. Um, just while on the topic of him, he made made me think of something. So Danilo was on the trellis frame bike, uh, which is Correct. the the old bike, which well, I say old bike, the the bike the current bike for customers. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Sanders was also on that, and there's been a lot of talk about that, but a lot of people, a lot of viewers don't really realise. The difference between the bikes and that there were different bikes at Dakar and I think it's important maybe to have a bit of a discussion about because you understand it a bit you've ridden both trellis frame bikes and and uh, the the more conventional kind of motocross frame bikes um, put not the that new rally bike but the, the you know the the concept of the frame is similar to a motocross bike for example um, now KTM have been working on the new bike for a long time, which is a step away from the trellis frame and probably one of the most, the biggest reasons to do that is weight saving uh, because the weight, the frame weight is significantly less. Um, but uh, 
Daniel Sanders is the the probably key decision for me. Is he he made he really wanted to use the trellis frame bike. He, he felt that it was uh, it was better for him and more suited to his riding. And uh, you know I, I I didn't imagine for a moment that KTM stroke gas gas stroke Cuscana would allow one of their factory riders to ride the old bike when they've got this brand new bike. And clearly Daniel showed that not only in performance, but actually on the video footage we saw, that I saw, you could see that that trellis frame bike was quite a bit more stable on the high speed stuff than the new bike. Um, and that was real surprising to me. Like, w which way are KTM going to go now? I'm sure they're going to stick with the new, the new frame and the new bike, but for sure they're going to be working on that stability. Yeah, so a couple of thoughts on that. Um, the first one is that obviously we all, all want to ride a lighter bike. Mm -hmm. uh, we all want to pick a lighter bike up when we <laughs> fall over. <laughs> fall over, yeah. Um, but I feel like a lack of weight, especially in a rally application, cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. um, the, the heavier bike is going to, it's going to track better. It's a better ratio of sprung to unsprung weight. Mm -hmm. And um, I think anyone who's ridden an adventure bike and a dirt bike probably can recognize the adventure bike is less work in a lot of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Then when it gets too technical, obviously yeah. the lighter bike comes, comes into its yeah. own. Um, and so, you know, to me, it's, it's sort of like I understand the desire to lose weight, but I also feel like that can... That that isn't all for the better in all circumstances. I feel there's like the, a, there's like a crossing point, you know, and mm. what what's happened is they've reached the crossing point where it turns into an enduro bike and it loses its stability and performance in other areas, and and I mm. think they're right on the tipping point now. And for for me, like I love riding the trellis frame bikes since the 690, the one that I rode around the world on, and then the 450, and then the EFI bikes, and right up to the latest 22 bike, which is the trellis frame bike still. And uh, yes, of course, I want to jump on a new bike and, and try it. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be an, an amazing thing because let's face it, that the 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 difficulty the, the little bit that they're trying to find in all the, between all those riders is so small most of us mortal wouldn't even notice it you know the, um, the other the other is if I can jump in for a second mm. it it seems to me like the the trellis frame bike really comes into its own at speed mm. it's it's where you have those the high speed uh, big loads into the frame and the stiffness of that yeah. frame. Yeah. gives the bike a different feel. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we don't, most of us don't really ride 65 to 100 miles mm. an hour all day. Yeah. The way yeah. that, like some of these stages yeah. in Dakar, I think this year we've had a, at least one stage where the f winning finish time was over 70 mm. miles an hour for the stage. Mm. That's yeah. that's fast off-road. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. 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 And we don't, it's not something we, probably most of us do with any regularity. No, no, for sure. And I think, like, the way I look at it is, like, you, all those, there's 30, 32 litres of fuel on the bikes, you know? That's, that's quite a few kilograms of stuff. You imagine putting that weight in kilograms as luggage on an adventure bike, and then put the same weight on a 450XC and try riding it at speed, it'll be much better on an adventure bike that's got a bit more weight behind it yeah. and, a, and a stiffer chassis and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously a lot comes down to suspension, but if you've got the same setup of suspension on them both, then you would feel more comfortable adding he uh, a bit of weight like that onto a already heavy bike than when you're adding it onto a super lightweight bike. Um, so I, I might have different experience than you because living in Europe, you had access to the, the RFRs, the, the mm. factory bikes more readily than we did in America. And so mm. I actually built, um, I had a 525 Mecha Systems bike, and then I had, I raced on a mm. uh, XCW, um, where I think yeah, you, all of yeah, your cars good... have been on factory bikes. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's, the, a, that's a good a point. Rally that you, yes. Yeah, that's a good point you can share, because you, for those watching, you raced the Dakar on an EXC, correct? On yep, an XCW. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. And yeah, so, sure. and so the point is to me, it's like, 
uh, my experience with all of those sort of conventional framed bikes is that they're easier to ride in technical slower conditions and they're harder to ride when it gets fast they get kind of whippy they get kind yeah, of yeah. Uh, active or, or uh, mm. um, they don't yeah. settle nervous 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 and then yeah. now today i own two of the factory bikes of the trellis bikes mm. a, a 690 and a and a 450 efi and those bikes are unbelievable you know mm. you point them at a at a rough road um and, I, and i've ridden back to back on a on a uh conventional frame bike and a trellis frame bike and mm. granted they weren't the same suspension they, it's not fair to do a totally apples to apples comparison yeah, yeah but yeah. all of the enduro bikes universally have a nervous feeling and none of the trellis frame bikes do the trellis frame bikes mm. just track yeah. and go straight yeah. so and, i and the, yeah i agree and and the only time that you would really really be thankful of having the enduro bike would be when the going gets really gnarly and tough uh, and the trellis frame bikes feel a little bit numb and heavy compared yeah. to an enduro bike, and and I think that's the point. Is they they're trying to give the riders a more agile bike with the weight lower down um, and the weight lower generally, uh, mm -hmm. but also trying to keep that stability and um, uh, you know reliability in terms of knowing what it's going to do. And I think they've reached the crossroads. I think they're yeah. at the point where like it's. And when they do one thing, it impacts another. And that's, they get into the point where it's getting really difficult, just like in MotoGP, to find that last little bit. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens going forwards. I, I think, I think too, though, um, you know, we're, we're picking apart a bike we've never ridden. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me like, no matter what, it takes a long time to develop a bike. And oh, yeah. Yeah. that the latest trellis bike has been in development under the factory mm -hmm. riders since 16 2016 is mm -hmm. that right mm -hmm. uh, and the latest yeah be, mm, maybe 17 yeah, 2016 surely started doing development on it in no nah, it was first it first raced in 18 so 17 will be when they were doing the heavy development yeah okay so yeah so next yeah but it will take to make a major change like the frame technology, it will take them time mm. to find the magic sauce, even if the ultimate uh, even if the ultimate outcome is potentially better on the mm. new frame, it will take them time to get it as good as the old one mm. was, just with how much time they had on the old one in developing yeah, it sure. and getting yeah. in comfort with it. And and for sure I'm I'm sure COVID played a part as well in mm -hmm. testing and everything else so uh and and you know what i would i don't doubt i i'm in fact 100 percent sure that ktm and the austrian teams will make it right so yeah. it, it yeah. it's going to get there and it's going to be an amazing bike uh, yeah. and i can't wait to see that i think my point was just i was a little bit shocked to see both Same. bikes at Dakar. <laughs> Same. And uh, because I didn't expect that, you know, I, I thought they would just go all in, everyone on one bike or everyone on another bike, and yeah. and they didn't. So yeah, yeah, but it's it's how things are going. So good luck with that KTM, and uh, I'm looking forward to see how it develops of future races. Yeah. Same. Um, so another point I wanted to discuss with you because it's something that happened under 2017. Uh, is stage cancellations? Yeah, we had uh, one too. Had, you had one too. Mm -hmm. um, how did how did you feel on your Dakar when you had a stage stage cancellation? And what was the reason for the cancellation and things like that? Just to just to run through some scenarios, you know, because obviously there's a lot of speculation about eh, should it have been cancelled, shouldn't it have been cancelled, and there's so many things that are rolled into that decision to make that difficult decision for the organisation. Uh, just thought let's discuss it and let's figure out let's to kind of put some thoughts on to whether should the Dakar be doing this or you know what how so, yeah um, so so the first thing is uh I feel like and I'm curious if you have the same opinion but I've come to not trust a thing the ASO has to say publicly 
So yes. <laughs> they say there's a sandstorm and you're like, really? Because I didn't see one. Or, or yeah. they say there's whatever and it's like <laughs> they're master at yeah. keeping you guessing and there's, it's, to me, it's like everything they say is for effect and not necessarily mm. just strictly truth. So yeah. do you have that same, no, I, same feeling? Yeah, I've, a couple of things that I've seen that have been like, well, oh, really, I didn't see it like Ooh. that. But it's very difficult to say that when you're not on the ground, yeah. you know, and 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 I know I know I've been close to the like the ASO and with the media and everything before and you pick up bits that things that have happened that you don't think about and then you think actually yeah it must be a tough decision to make that and I, yeah. and I get it you know like for example I get it if there's too many accidents or something and there's and no, the, not enough helicopters right we had that Af we had that Africa race you know we at Africa race um, you know the race organizer met us flew in in his airplane to a fuel stop and was really sorry but he said guys I cannot let you go on because the weather's bad. It was, it was windy. Uh, and also we've, we're struggling for resource and mm -hmm. it's too, de it's too risky from my side as an organizer to continue. And I hate to do this guys, but I have to, I have mm -hmm. to say, we've got to stop here today. And, and that was really personal. And it was like, I get it. You know, I get it. It's, it's genuine. Um, and this is it. Um, but to hear some comments like the stage was canceled cause it was too tough. And things like that it's kind of like really and honestly like I, I was a bit surprised to hear so many of the top guys complaining about the terrain and and the, re the reason for that not because I don't think they're tough or anything like that and obviously they don't you, you know you only have to clip a few blind square edges a few times to know like oof that's sketchy I know that I get that um, but you get that anyway in racing you get that in the Baja 1000 there's no cautions in the Baja 1000 you you ride the terrain that you see, you know? Yeah. And so there's a lot of what, how I felt in Dakar 2017, I think it was. It could have been 18, but I think it was 17. They cancelled the stage because but the trucks went out. Um, the trucks were going first. So they made a decision to the trucks and cars to start first, to like flip the reverse it. Before the stage even started, only the top riders... Only three or four, one mentioned it to another and another and then a few more got in and then they all started talking about it. And, and the next thing that they're having a discussion with the organization about the bikes is too dangerous for the bikes and the bike shouldn't do it. But the thing is, the day before, the same type of scenario happened where it was extremely rough. It was really rough, right? But people that have trained in those really rough terrains um, did really well. So for example, for me, it was much better to have a race that was super rough and chopped up and difficult and challenging because that's where I excelled. So I can see that what happens is when they canceled the stage because a few people said it was too dangerous and things, and yes, Ross Branch had a huge crash. Um, I, right, I understand right off the start. Why, yeah, I understand why they wanted to do that. Um, but also there was a lot of people that had an opportunity to make a really good day out of that. Yeah. And they they've paid their money and they didn't have that opportunity. And that, for me, it's a very difficult. It's a very fine line. Um, and I'm not saying they should or they shouldn't. I mean, at the end of the day, they did, and that's what happened. Um, but just wanted to share some thoughts from your side. What what you think about it? Yeah. Well, I I think so. The first thing what I what I meant by my comment about the ASO is that I feel like n not that their word isn't any good, but that they are a master of spin. And mm. and so I feel like the story that we get may not be the whole story. The public face may not be the whole story. So yeah. we may not have enough information to really make a good conclusion mm. about what they should or should not have done. So that's one. A second thing, uh, you know, I can't speak to the resources that they had or didn't have. Um, I totally understand the necessity of if you're going to put people out performing at that level and you've promised them a level of support in terms of helicopters and so on for safety, mm. then you have to deliver that or you have to cancel the stage. I, I understand that math yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, and I yeah, see that. Yeah, I get that, yeah. Yeah, because you can't, you can't tell people, hey, there's no helicopters this afternoon, so just slow down a little, okay? Like, that mm. doesn't work. That's, that's yeah. not how it can operate. But it, but it, sorry, 
I'm interrupting, sorry, Ned. No, please. It, it, see, it, it seems to me like the stage was cancelled because of the riders' decision. That wasn't the organisation. I heard, I heard that as well, and I heard, mm. um, I had heard an interview with Sanders where he was saying that a bunch of people, uh, you know, called and made a complaint and whatever, and and so, uh, you know, mm. I, I don't know, I don't know what happened, but I heard the mm. same kind of thing. And I think, generally speaking, it's not it's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed mm-hmm. to be reasonable, and uh, yeah. and I feel like it should not be canceled because it's tough. Yeah, it very okay. well could be canceled because it can't be supported safely or some other mm-hmm. aspect like that. But I think it should yeah. never be canceled just because it's hard. That that isn't the yeah. spirit of yeah. the race. Yeah, and and if there is. Something like I think what happened with Ross Branch is there was something there that wasn't marked um, that came there because of the trucks or whatever. But I mean, it, they were there, they put a marker on it, and there's still two hours of bikes going through. Like, that's fine, you know? Yeah. Like, people people know that there's something there. Um, well, and but, that happens. And they can do that. That happens yeah. every year. I mean, I, I remember, uh, you know, my year, there's a lot of ambiguity in the road book, and I, and I think more mm-hmm. now, maybe, than there even used to be. Yeah. And we were sent up this dry wash, and I think they expected we would be on one side and we were on the other, and there was a huge hole. And, yeah. and so uh, someone got hurt there. The front runners mm-hmm. actually just made it across. They were going so fast. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah. I don't know, I'm going to say 20th place or something, yeah. somewhere in that zone someone didn't make it had a pretty bad crash and they mm-hmm. landed a helicopter and just steered everyone around it and yeah. so that's yeah. not a new circumstance that happens i think no. every year mm-hmm. and yeah, and agree. so if they needed to deal with a certain scenario they had tools available other than just canceling mm-hmm. the stage yeah i agree i agree well you know hopefully they they sit down, they discuss it, they have a rethink, they they decide what to do next year and they, they make a plan, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, they've got to do... I can understand the difficulty um, of the race organiser, you know, to make that decision. Like, he's getting all these calls from the riders saying it's too dangerous, it's too dangerous because the trucks went through and it's all chopped and this and the other. And when five or six of them do it, he's, he's got to make a decision, you know. Yeah, and it's... That, that's hard, that's hard. Um because if he if he said yeah carry on right and, and then someone gets hurt people have, especially if somebody has a big crash and gets really hurt then it would feel that he didn't listen to them and and I, I understand that I mean if I was in his shoes it would be the same so yeah <laughs> um, it's it, it's very difficult but I think that that's where they need some uh, some sort of um, steps in place to say this is the approach we take in these scenarios you know uh, and I'm sure they'll learn from that so that's good. I, I think generally, um, you know, my perception is that a lot of the car, the car drivers are not as strong at navigation. They're mostly able mm. to follow moto tracks. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure that that's not fair. You know, you look at, I'm not going to say Petter Hansel doesn't know how to navigate. Obviously he does. Mm. Um, but I've, I've heard from a lot of people in the bivouac that the, the car teams are not as strong at navigating because they do it so little so i see the temptation to put cars and trucks on the course on virgin terrain uh with that said um i I think the decision to follow them with motorcycles is probably rarely a good one i think sending motorcycles into the terrain that the cars and trucks have just been Mm -hmm. through is never gonna never gonna be a great call it, it it changes too much. For example, the people that haven't done it, um, you know, if you get like um, a really, really hard pack track, for example, it's a hard pack track and there's nothing in there. But when you've had a hundred cars and fifty trucks go through it, there's a lot of really deep, soft, fresh, fresh bulldust, and it's not in the road book. That's going to really catch someone out. And that's yeah. I agree with you there. If you if you let the cars and trucks go first, then just don't let bikes go over it afterwards. That, that's a sound decision to make from now onwards. <laughs> well, you're never, and you're never going to be able to do a road book that accurately captures, you know, you would have to be writing the road book while the cars and trucks are still on it to use it the yeah. next day for the bikes. It just doesn't work. So to yeah. me, it's like, well, if you want to have, and they're doing some kind of clover leaf, you know, multiple stages out of the same bivouac. 
Mm. It's like, fine, but if you used it for cars and trucks one day, don't use it for bikes the next. I, that's just yeah, not a good I solution. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. So a new topic uh, and something that's really close to my heart with all the um, kind of vlogging, video blogging and all the stuff that I've done at Dakar is uh, cameras and the use of cameras at Dakar and something that really like it, it kind of frustrated me a little bit. I saw that uh, the Coronel brothers were were fined a thousand euros for having cameras on the outside of the car and and I was like they've done that for years you know like it's the coronel brothers it's what they do you know they bring awesome footage to the people that want to watch dakar and they've got their own channel and everything but i know that that doesn't come cheap they have to pay to, to, to do that um but you know it, it felt a little bit harsh when they said that uh, it was because the cameras were bolted on the outside of the bodywork and those cameras can be dangerous to pedestrians and other motorcycle competitors and i'm like hang on a minute you give the Dakar Heroes riders cameras and bolt them on the handlebars and the nav towers. You think those are not dangerous to the riders when they're riding? I mean, it seems like they've gone a little bit crazy with the rules and everything on the camera situation. It started for me when I was told that I couldn't use... I had a, I had a cheek-mounted camera for Dakar 2018, which I was planning to use um, on the helmet. And then they said, no helmet cameras, you know, it's banned. You've got to use a chest camera. And then after the Dakar, a couple of months after the Dakar, I was on a road racing circuit on a track day, um, and and they said, oh no, you can't have it on your chest because it's it's dangerous. It can in, it it can protrude into your chest cavity and cause all sorts of injuries. And it's like they just make it up as they go along, and I think that certainly the rule saying you can't have them on the outside of the car is a bit daft, if you ask me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it seems like if you get hit by a car, the last thing that's on your mind is whether a camera was part of the collision. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I get, I get the, I get the helmet camera rule. I understand that um, why they don't want people putting them on on the helmets. But um, where is it going to stop? It's like it seems like yeah. pretty crazy at the moment. Yeah. I um, uh, I think there's a bigger question there, which is you know the ASO is at least in some part a media company, mm. and uh, I mean they're a race promoter, but the media is what brings them a lot of value. And, and my suspicion is that they are pretty sensitive and you probably have a, a strong feeling about this as well. They're pretty sensitive to yeah. people who are generating content that they don't control. And exactly that. And that's, that's really what it is. And, but the thing is they do, they, they seem to be doing a bad job of controlling that content Yeah. because there's people putting all sorts out not legitimately that haven't paid for the rights to do it and it just gets left out there um and like for example i can share with people when i did my um when i did my video uh video series and the movie that i did in 2017 um one of the constraints that was put on me was that no more no more than three minutes per day in stage footage they limited that in stage footage that was like a, a requirement on their side that they had to do um, and that was, it was difficult to stomach at first, um, but it's kind of how it is. And I've seen that like a few others have got the same limitation. Um, but like the Coronel brothers, for example, they're paying big money to the ASO. I mean, it's a lot of money. Like it, I paid 10,000 euros just for the video rights in 2017, uh, on top of the cost of, you know, doing the production and having everything set up and entry fees and getting to Dakar and stuff. Um, and, and teams like Coronel Brothers that are doing like epic stuff with video um, are paying a lot of money to do that. Um, and really, the way I looked at it, the, the difficulty I had of accepting that was that really, is, is my is my 10 minute per day video really going to impact your sport or somebody that much, you know? Um, but what I actually realize now is that it did, you know, yeah. it did influence people and people do like watching that real down to earth stuff, you know, like uh, grassroots stuff, I suppose you could say. Yeah, but I, I feel I, my perception is that maybe more people found and enjoy the Eurosport footage who were introduced by you than, mm. than you took away dedicated Eurosport yeah content viewers who said oh i'm not going to watch eurosport anymore i'm just going to watch linden i feel like it's more yeah. the first than the second 
So in that yeah. regard, it's like, well, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. Having all of these individual channels like the Coronel Brothers, like you did in your time, um, these are these are the gateway to get people into watching the official footage. I do understand not wanting to have uh, too much in-stage footage released. I, mm. I see where they're coming from. I think anyone could. Um, but it does, you get to this point where you're just like, really, I'm paying you to run my camera on myself and I can't show the footage? That mm. feels a bit off, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you said in your time, like my time was over, <laughs> um, but you said like in your time, you know, I was, I was fully planning to be at Dakar 22. Mm -hmm. That was my, my plan was to be there, um, first with a team and that didn't work out. Uh, and so the ASO did, they actually called me and said like, Hey, are you still going to come on your own? Even though that it didn't work out with the team and everything. And I said, yeah, I'd love to, um, but I want to make a, a really, I've got a really cool idea. Uh, can I share it with you? And I had a meeting with them and I shared it and everything. Um, and they just didn't get back to me. And it really hurt. Eh? It yeah. just, it made me feel like it's just that they're just not interested in that stuff. They're not interested in the good things that people like myself and, and various other enthusiastic individuals can make. Um, they're just inter interested in the big time and that's it. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a real shame that I'm not there this year because uh, I, I would have been, you know, I had a bike ready and everything for it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a shame. Yeah. Um, Were you going to Mali Moto it again or go with the team? Yeah, well, with the team at first and then after after that fell through, then I was going to go back Mali Moto, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to do Mali Moto with a, another new project with a difference, but uh, I'm going to keep that in the bag for now because I maybe do it somewhere else. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, and and what I've seen as well is that, it, it, and if I say too much about it, then somebody else will get the idea and copy it, because that's what's been happening anyway. People <laughs> seem to copy what I did. <laughs> so, but I actually think it's great for the sport that there's more people out there doing vlogging of racing and stuff. You know, it's uh, it's it's good to, you know, you know, there's the Italian guy there with the POV footage. Uh, uh, this this time doing it and does the the guys from Spain you know the uh, twin trail team doing it and you know it's, it's great to see that hopefully they few of those got influenced by what I did and and got the motivation to do it and and are sharing content which is which is great so the other I, I'm really pleased to see all the podcasts uh, I mean it, it's a little yeah. self serving to say on a podcast that the podcasts are great but they are <laughs> and yeah. uh, and so you know when I podcasting wasn't really a thing in 2012 at least not like it is today mm -hmm. i was doing those uh call-ins you know and and recording on rally radio which was a bit ahead of its time yeah um but i think you know for anyone who's a rally geek like i am it's such a cool time to be following because yeah. there's so much more access to information mm -hmm. than there has been in in years past so yeah and I don't even have time to keep up with the rally. Now. Yeah, no. Like I'm busy, <laughs> Me neither. I'm busy doing other. I'm busy doing other things and priorities elsewhere, and I can't even keep up on the ADV thread. I've given up now. Yeah. <laughs> like the F, the, you know, the F five thread. It's just like I got gapped. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got. I every time I come in, it's like twenty pages on. It's like man, I can't keep up with this thing anymore. Yeah. Um, but ADV rider is a great place to follow the race. So much information and. Good to see so many new people on there as well asking interesting questions. Because clearly they don't know anything about Dakar and yeah. getting involved and getting hooked into it. So it's it's good for the sport and uh, yeah, it's, that's that's the main thing. So yeah, I struggle to keep up with it. I literally I probably spend about twenty minutes a day trying to cat, look at results just to see what's going on while I'm in the workshop or something, and then I'll watch the Eurosport footage on a night time, and, and that's it. <laughs> that's about my extent of uh, of what goes on. You know, for me, the first time. In the morning, I'll roll over, and it'll be, oh, 4.30 or 5 in the morning. And that's mm -hmm. about, that's after the stage is finished. And yeah. so I will uh, just pull my phone out in bed and just look at uh, tracking Dakar, you know, Misha's site. Yeah. And just see, like, yeah. how the stage happened. And the biggest interest for me is just seeing finisher names and not seeing withdrawals. Yeah. You know, it's such a yeah. relief. The people that I know, like Andrew Short and Mason and Ricky and so on, when I see their names on in at the ASS, whether it was a good day or a bad day for them, that's just a big sigh of relief yeah. for me. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. 
for sure. Yeah. It is. It, it it. There's no getting away from the fact that it is a dangerous sport at the front on bikes. Yeah. Um. It's it, you know the, these guys are really putting it on the line. Yeah. Um. Uh, they have to be very precise and they have to stay focused 100% every time. You know, one tiny little mistake and it's over. Yeah. And. Uh, and you know we've we've had it all too often years gone by and i think is it the 11th today yeah it's the anniversary of me only today mm-hmm. um is that how long ago is that 15 years or something yeah yeah i think so it is 15 and it was 15 it was going to be ago. his last last race that that time and yeah yeah so you know and uh elmer and caldicott and there's mm-hmm. so many names passed by um uh yeah caselli yeah <laughs> um so yeah, it's uh, it's a time that we have to think about those guys because uh, they helped to put Valley on the map as well for everybody. They were they were yeah, they there fighting for the lead. So, yeah, they did. And cool. It... No, it's really. Go on. Go on. No, <laughs> you were just saying. Oh, I I I, I was just saying. Uh, I I think that people forget sometimes. Uh, you know when it happens to me when I'm watching and. I, I'm so excited about the results and I'm, and I'm seeing who did what today and, and so on. And you forget like, you know, hundreds of kilometers. There's so many chances for something to go wrong. And for those Mm -hmm. this year, largely guys to hold it together, to be consistent and to just go so fast. It's really, it is, it is just an amazing accomplishment. Uh, yeah. And, and I think it sometimes you feel like, oh, you know, I, you know, I'm a Brabeck fan, and I and I've been really hoping for him to be able to put time back into people over the rally, which he has done to some extent. Mm. But you forget mm. how fast everyone else is still going, and <laughs> I mean, it's just it's incredible. I mean, it's it's second by second being absolutely as uh, greedy as you can be to vacuum up Mm. every inch of that desert as fast as they can vacuum it up. It's, it's really, man, it's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. And, and I've heard, I've heard a saying, and I think, uh, Mason mentioned it in one of his posts that, uh, uh, Skyler said to him something that you probably know what it was, but something like if if you're not full gas or full brake, you're losing time. (laughs) Like, you know, like, and it, and it's hard to ride like that. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's, It's yeah. intense, and, and I was watching it last night, and uh, I'm here with my parents, and my dad was watching it with me, and uh, man, watching Walkner, he was jumping everything like, and not just a little bit, like twenty, thirty feet, and <laughs> you know, and, and that, yeah. that's how Sanders hit the thing. You know, he jumped a blind thing, landed on an up face, and smashed into the nav. I mean, you don't know what's at the other side, yeah. and they're taking so many risks, yeah. but get the guys watching. You have to take those risks up at the front. You have to do it. Yeah. I mean, you you got you got to get on it and not not slow down at all. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Because the moment you slow, there's a wolf pack of twenty riders behind you. Bam, they're on you. Right. So, yeah, hundred percent. It's yeah. it's really amazing. So the one thing yeah. that we haven't covered, I just wanted to to say quickly mm-hmm. about. If I'm correct, there were no bike withdrawals for the first four days of the race, and I th- four days. I, and I think still, even now, the number of withdrawals is very low. It used to be yeah. pretty consistently 50%. 50%, and now it's nowhere near that. And I think that's another that's another case of a change in the vibe of the rally. Um, mm. And uh, I, I, I cheer for every single person. I don't want anyone to go out. And yet, at the mm. same time, I feel like that's a loss to have it be everyone. Everyone gets to the finish. That's not how it was ever intended. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, and we've not we've not discussed Malimoto at all. I'm surprised that that hasn't come up in the conversation. Yeah. But I, I just wanted to say I've been following that quite closely. Mm. Um, and the guy that the guy that's leading it, like, he's over an hour in front of the second place. I mean, mm. it's it's legit. Yeah. Like, he's where is he's he up, in the twenties? Oh wow. I think like twenty something, yeah. Um, What's it's, your it's best right finish? What's your best overall? Uh, thirty second. Yeah. Thir- second in Malamoto, thirty second overall. Yeah. Um, and the first place in Malamoto was twenty eighth. Yeah. When I finished second, um, when I finished thirty second, the first was only twenty eighth. So it's not. It wasn't that far away. Um, but you know, to go to go and do Malamoto and to be 
up in the top 30 is legit. Like, it's legit. Yeah. Like, you're doing it. I mean, this guy is putting time into them over and over. I've noticed in the last three days he's dropped back a little bit. And honestly, I think that's just a wise move on his part. Mm-hmm. He's decided, hey, I'm at rest day. I've got an hour in hand. I don't need to push anything in the second half. I just need to finish. Mm-hmm. And he's just putting consistent times in to finish. You can see. And he won the last two years, I think, the same guy. So yeah. um, he's, he's a serious uh, knows serious the game. rider. Because... Yeah, he knows he knows the game. He knows what you need to do, um, and he's getting on and doing it. And uh, yeah, full credit to him because that Malimoto class is, uh, yeah, it's it's legit yeah. for sure. So. Yeah, and I think uh, <clears throat> you know another part of it, as you said earlier, there's a lot more to qualifying to go to Dakar now than there was certainly yeah. 20 years mm-hmm. ago, and yeah. uh, and so I think the level of competitor has has really risen. You know, you're seeing fewer yeah. of the, I'll call them adventurists, and more, like, mm-hmm. pretty damn legitimate riders, uh, really yeah. throughout the pack. So Yeah, for sure. The, the races, the, the level of competition is just, it's different to what it has been before. I mean, even in Malamoto, we're seeing, that I follow very closely, mm-hmm. every year, every year, the front five of Malamoto a step up yeah. you know a, a step up in the G, in the general classifications and 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 we're seeing also that like i was surprised to see that like the top 10 were in like 37 minutes yeah at the rest at the rest day but then even if you go deeper than that to the top 30 they're all within an hour and a half yeah like it's like yeah. it was crazy like it's so, there's so many competitive riders there now um pushing for those positions um that it's it's anybody's game you know it's like it just depends how it goes on so many levels navigation bike make bike failures um look yeah you know, not hitting something that's going to kick you off the bike and you know it's bradley cox today just hit a rock and broke his fuel tank i mean it's just you don't know what's coming in dakar that's the thing that's what makes it so special me cross-country racing is that like you don't there's so many variables anything can happen and the, the days are so long uh, daniel sanders crashed on the liaison you know yeah. and and you know at first when i heard that i was like no 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 like why and then again so much speculation um but actually you know it happened twice to us on africa race with the team you know greg raff hit diesel on a roundabout mm-hmm. and 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 went down you know it's so happy you don't see it it's the dark you're on a liaison and then obviously um uh it all changes joey in a second hit, hit, yeah yeah and joey hit joey hit the camel that was on a liaison yeah you know it's like how how do you write this stuff like it it's not because they weren't concentrating or something like that it just happens this stuff and it can happen on the liaison and it can happen in the stage it's not it's not just just the racing part is the is the rally it's the whole thing yeah um so yeah, it's uh, it's definitely been interesting to watch this year. Yeah, um, yeah. Cool. Well, look, we're an hour and ten. If you, have you got anything you want to add or anything that you, we can discuss, Ned, or shall we shall we wrap it up and let people get on with the day after they finish listening? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's just it's a pleasure to. Uh, one of my favorite things about Dakar is that you you are connected with people all around the world who care about this same crazy sport. And, um, and so it's fun to talk about it with you. It's, it's fun to know how many people everywhere, uh, do still see that spirit. And I think the spirit has taken some hits as we started off by discussing, but it still is just an amazing event. And, uh, it is, it's, it's amazing to, to see what those, those people do to, to get through, to perform at that high a level and to do it for so long and so far. So. Yeah, I I totally agree. And you you know when you when you meet somebody new that's not into motorsport and um and they say what do you do and you race rally bikes and you did Dakar and they say to you oh, what's Dakar? Like you cannot explain to them what Dakar is. It's impossible. Yeah. Not in that first sitting. They have to experience it. They have to see it. They have yeah. to watch it. They have to understand it. They have to read about it because it's such a incredible event. Um, uh, and it's one of a kind yeah. and it will continue to be that for a long time although with the new world championship now it's probably getting closer to some of the other events you know like we're all they're all pretty much becoming the same now in the world championship and Dakar's probably less of a 
dare I say it, it's less of a amazing single event that stands on its own. It's a part of a bigger thing now. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the big changes that we've seen this year. But credit to, you know, obviously anybody, anybody that's put themselves into that position uh, in a car, quad, bike, truck, side by side, whatever, to get through the Dakar is no mean feat. It's a serious event. So 100%. Um, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I'll let you get on with your day. <laughs> Go do what you do in Baja. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and yeah, and I'm gonna get ready to go. But actually, I'm gonna go watch the Dakar. So. <laughs> All right. I haven't watched. I haven't even seen any results today. I've been flat out, so I've not seen what's happened today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Ned. Re- really appreciate your time. Um, thanks again for. Um, for encouraging me to do Dakar because it definitely uh, changed my whole life for quite a few years, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. Good to see you, Pitt. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. See you soon, mate. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.